Greetings. Welcome to the American Antiquarian Society's program, Herald of Freedom, Perspectives from the Collections. We're coming to you from the ancestral homelands of the Nipmuc tribal community who remain an active presence here in central Massachusetts. My name is Nan Wolverton, Vice President for Academic and Public Programs at the Society, and we're delighted to be starting a new year of programming. Our mission at AAS is to cultivate a deeper understanding of the American past grounded in the primary sources that we've been collecting here since 1812. In addition to welcoming researchers from around the world to use our collections, both physical and digital, we host programs that feature aspects of the collections and the fruits of research, and we provide insights into the past and its residents for our own day. We thank all of you for joining us, and as a nonprofit organization, we welcome any support that you can provide to help support this work. And thank you very much. I am joined today by my colleagues, Amanda Kondek, program coordinator, and Nate Fisk, photographer and media producer. Amanda will be posting links and relevant information in the chat throughout the program, and Nate will be helping out with filming in our conservation lab, which you will see later on. We will have time for your questions and conversation later in the program. So please use the Q&A feature for your questions and you can type those in at any point during the program. And know that this program is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel soon. In the interest of time, I'm going to introduce each of our speakers now and then I will turn it over to them. And I'm gonna start by introducing um, our, a, a special guest. We're very delighted to have Professor Nikki Taylor join us for today's program. Dr. Taylor is Professor of History and Chair of the Department at Howard University. She specializes in 19th century African-American history. Her subspecialties are in urban, African-American women and intellectual history. She's currently completing her fourth monograph, Brooding Over Bloody Revenge, Enslaved Women, Wild Justice and Lethal Resistance to Slavery. But it's Professor Taylor's second book, America's First Black Socialist, the Radical Life of Peter H. Clark, published by the University of Kentucky Press in 2013, that she will be speaking about today, given that Clark was the publisher of the Herald of Freedom. Dr. Taylor was elected to AAS membership in 2022. We're also fortunate to have with us Professor Derek Spires. Derek Spires is Associate Professor of Literatures in English and Affiliate Faculty in American Studies, Visual Studies, and Media Studies at Cornell University. He specializes in early African-American and American print culture, citizenship practices, and African-American intellectual history. His first book, The Practice of Citizenship, Black Politics and Print Culture in Early United States, published by the University of Pennsylvania Press in 2019, won the Modern Language Association Prize for First Book and the Bibliographical Society St. Louis Mercantile Library Prize. Dr. Spires was elected to AAS membership in 2020 and is a member of the AAS Board of Directors. And I'll just note that uh, Dr. Spires and Dr. Benjamin Fagan, who's Associate Professor of English at Auburn University, co-led last year a summer seminar in the Program for the History of Book in American Culture here at AAS. Uh, that seminar was titled Black Print, Black Activism, and Black Study, and they taught the Herald of Freedom uh, during that course. Um, and this July, they will co-lead a similar seminar for Rare Book School that will be here at the American Antiquarian Society. And that course is titled African American Print Cultures in the 19th Century. And you can find a link to a course district description for that course in the, in the uh, chat. Also speaking this afternoon will be Claire Morton. She's a graduate fellow in uh, paper conservation and a dual master's and MS candidate at the Garment Art Conservation Department, the Uni State University of New York at Buffalo. She was a summer 2022 conservation intern at the AAS, where she worked on the Herald of Freedom and three 18th century broadsides. Eclair previously held fellowships at the Museum of Modern Art and is in private practice in New York. Vincent Golden is a curator of newspapers and periodicals at AAS, and he's been with us for 20 years. He provides reference service to the collection as well as building and improving access to it. Vince also works with our other curators towards collection development and coordination of multi-collection projects. Vince uh, was unexpectedly, 
unexpectedly called out of town this week, so he's unable to join us in person, but we did manage to get a short video of him talking about the Herald. So we're going to start uh, this afternoon's program with that short video. This is Vincent Golden, and I'm the curator of newspapers and periodicals here at the American Antiquarian Society, a job which I've held for just over 20 years. Now last summer I was going through a box of backlog material. Now the dirty truth of most institutions and libraries is that they have backlogs of unprocessed material, stuff that they're, they haven't processed yet that they're not even sure of what they have. And some of our backlog here goes back from before the time I started. Well, last summer I pulled off this one box of backlog material that dated from before I started. So this is before 2002. I opened it up and started going through the newspapers in it, and they were in rough shape. And there was two issues of the Herald of Freedom from Cincinnati from 1855 that were in rough shape. And I searched the online catalog, we didn't have it. Then I searched the Chronically in America database of American newspapers, and it wasn't in there either. Now this becomes interesting because apparently this is an unknown paper. Nobody has it. So then I started with the editor and publisher, Peter Clark. And that's when I discovered we had a biography in our collection published in 2012 the author was Nikki Taylor, in which she described him as the first black socialist of America. And then at, when I pulled that volume, I looked up the Herald of Freedom in there, and it described the paper as lasting about four months and that no copies were extant. So these were discovery pieces. Now, yeah, what, what are these such important pieces doing in our backlog? Well, back then, they didn't have the same tools that we would have today at our fingertips. It would have been much harder for someone working through that box to just bring up all this information. They would have had to go to the shelves. They would have had to do more digging. And considering the condition of these, they're probably looking at um, time versus possible results versus what else they had to do. So they're there might have, that might have been the reason why they were still on the shelf. Anyway, so here are, are two issues of a very important African-American newspaper published in Cincinnati in June of 1855. They have to be issue number one and issue number three. Issue one had been folded up and was badly soiled on one of the panels. Issue number three had actually separated into three pieces along folds. Not only was this important paper, we took it to conservation, and they have spent a lot of time cleaning the papers, mending the the tears, and trying to make them stable, presentable, and usable. And that is one of the things that will be discussed tonight. I mean, but this is just an amazing paper, an amazing find, and one of my jobs is acquisitions, building the collection of. A collection that is stagnant dies over time. You want to build it, and this happens to be a very exciting find that definitely enhances the collection. And now we'll turn things over to Dr. Taylor, who will speak to us about Peter Clark. Thank you, Nance, so much. I'm honored to be here. And I should say, in the chorus of voices of African Americans in the 19th century, one has been muted for far too long, and that is the voice of Peter Humphreys Clark of Cincinnati, who was a man with unfaltering commitment to the advancement of his race, his community, through his work for abolition, access to education, and also political empowerment. He was born a free man in 1829 in Cincinnati, and he began his career as an abolitionist in the 1840s, 
first serving as a delegate for the Convention of Colored Men. And then he became an anti-slavery lecturer. And he was an assistant editor for Frederick Douglass's journal and even lived with Frederick Douglass for a time in his home. Uh, and he was an editor for the Frederick Douglass's paper. And then he also uh, uh, was an editor of the Herald of Free Freedom as, as we all had just heard. Despite his varied and textured contributions to the abolitionist struggle in Cincinnati and in the nation, he was best known and committed uh, to his uh, uh, activism as a teacher in Cincinnati. Uh, he led the fight for African-Americans to have the right to attend public schools at a time when African-Americans rarely had that right in the nation um, and actually were excluded from public schools in Ohio. He became the first black principal of a uh, high school or of a black school system in Ohio. Uh, and he basically became one of the foremost, not just the a principal, which was basically the head of the whole school district, but he also became one of the foremost black intellectuals in the nation, uh, right up there with people like Frederick Douglass, T, T. Thomas Fortune, James McCune Smith, Martin Delaney, and John Mercer Langston. In fact, Peter Clark was at all of the leading debates where people were trying to decide the destiny of the Black community, whether we were debating whether we should just quit or leave America in favor of another nation, uh, or whether we should fight and, and resort to, uh, you know, more militant abolitionism. And so he did all of that. And then he also even considered socialism. That was another aspect of his long political career in which he thought that that might be one of the ways to save Black people. It was just one of many strategies that he used across his career. And so um, I argue in the book that he never fit into one ideological school across his long and varied and textured career. In fact, I argue in the book that his political and intellectual roots borrowed from at least four intellectual traditions, intellectual traditions that we might not necessarily associate with African-Americans, abolitionist uh, intellectual traditions, German free thinking traditions, enlightenment rationalism, and then also the African-American tradition. No other 19th century African-American intellectual was influenced by so many ideologies at once and across such a broad period of, of their lives. And so these ideologies tugged at him at different moments. And so uh, his newspaper is a reflection. The Herald of Freedom is a, is a reflection of one moment in his life. And I'm anxious to hear about all of the great findings. But for now, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Spires. Thank you all. All right, hello everyone. Um, thanks Dr. Taylor um, for passing the baton and thank you for your work on Peter Clark. I also wanna thank um, the staff here at AAS for organizing this program and for continuing to do the work that allows us to do our work. Um, I thought I'd take a moment to walk us through the contents of the Herald of Freedom and how it enhances our sense of African-American newspapers and American newspapers. I first heard of Vince's discovery the same way I learned about most news, at least until recently, via a Twitter post. It produced much excitement among those of us working on 19th century Black periodicals and organizing. It was doubly exciting because Ben Fagan and I were teaching the history of the book seminar and would get a chance to see the paper firsthand in just a few weeks. Peter H. Clark founded the Herald of Freedom as an explicitly anti-slavery newspaper serving first and foremost black communities in Cincinnati and Ohio. The paper was two sheets of four pages sold at five cents a week. Here we see the masthead motto to cast or sect or color unconfined and the secondary model on page two, the most formidable weapon against errors of every kind is reason, 
A quote from Thomas Paine's Age of Reason, both, both link Clark to the radical traditions Professor Taylor outlines in her work. As Jawan Wu's digital project, The Ohio Black Press in the 19th Century illustrates, the paper wasn't the first Ohio paper. Clark, Clark's immediate predecessor, William Howard Day's Alien American, published from 1853 to 1854 out of Cleveland, was a ready model and a cautionary tale. The Herald of Freedom's terms suggest Clark was angling towards bulk subscriptions. He issued a call for agents that also suggest he was hoping to foster a more horizontal relationship in which motivated subscription agents near railroad lines would take the initiative to buy papers in bulk at a discount and take advantage of the offer to quote, retain one cent for every copy delivered to support paying a boy for the trouble of circulating the paper. Clark directly contrasted this approach to Day, who started his paper by soliciting investments from Black Cleveland, including his wife, Lucy Stanton, and her stepfather. Clark's perspective suggests that the fate of Day's paper taught him that using the credit system, quote, is utter folly and ruin. The Herald of Freedom entered a Black press tradition and a Black self-publishing tradition, most famously articulated in the first editorial of Freedom's Journal, issued in 1827. We wish to plead our own cause. Too long have others spoken for us. Unlike the editors of early papers like Freedom's Journal and Colored American, who contended with the absence of a history of Black newspapers, Clark now had to contend with the history of Black newspapers starting and folding, not unlike most other papers. And a dispersed national Black press of multiple papers, from Frederick Douglass's paper to Mary Ann Shad's Provincial Freeman. As Clark proclaims in his salutatory, another colored man's newspaper exclaims the reader, What? Are they not sufficiently convinced by the failures of the past that a paper cannot be sustained? Are there no vacant straitjackets for these madmen? End quote. What does it mean to write oneself into a history of the Black press and newspapers? What does it mean to not be the first? The connections today go beyond learning from Day's mishaps with funding. Clark seems to be working actively against the recent memory of the cultural challenges they faced, responding implicitly to Day's confrontation with Horace Greeley, then editor of the New York Tribune, who complained that the African Americans only needed one paper, and that paper needed only be an anti-slavery organ. Greeley went a step further. In a May 1853 editorial, he characterized Black editors as novices propped up by well-meaning but naive white benefactors. While Day responded to Greeley in real time through the Alien American, Clark clearly felt an ongoing need to address Greeley and his ilk through his own pages. Quote, Greeley of the New York Tribune thinks it will require all the intellect of the colored men of the states concentrated to make a good newspaper. Rather a large idea of journalism, Mr. Tribune. If two or three white men with clever brains and a large amount of brass can make a readable paper, why not two or three well-educated and talented colored men perform the same work, end quote. Clark speaks to the need of a black press as a training ground and space of employment for black printers. And he proclaims that everyone in the production from typesetters to subscription agents would be black. So what else is in the paper? Clark's first column features minutes from the May 1855 meeting of the National Council of the Colored People, despite Clark's strong critiques of the council and its proposed industrial school. This meeting was a follow-up to the 1853 Rochester Convention, which created the National Council for the purpose of improving the character, developing the intelligence, maintaining the rights, and organizing the union of the colored people of the states. The council's signature effort was the unsuccessful founding of a manual labor school. Like other papers, Herald of Freedom also included poetry and fiction. Here we have a poem by Gerald Massey and a presumably serialized piece of fiction titled Neely, A Tale of the African Slave Trade, written for the Herald of Freedom. We also find a notice that J.P. Ball's daguerreotype exhibition was awarded a silver medal at the 1854 Ohio Mechanics Institute. The minutes to the National Council of Colored People that appear on the Herald of Freedom's first page appeared originally in the New York Daily Tribune on May 10th, 1855, but on page seven of eight. As a daily, the Tribune front-loaded advertising and announcements in its first page. 
format typical of a daily. But even after the ads, readers then go through several pages covering anniversary meetings of the American Tract Society, the American Congregational Union, the American Anti-Slavery Society, and the American Baptist Home Missionary Society before finally getting to page seven and the minutes from the National Council. To be fair, the slew of conventions happening around the same time would tend to crowd the news cycle, but to come in last on page seven, the difference between the Herald of Freedom and the Tribune rendered visually the ways that US news media and public opinion treated black print and organizing. As Clark observed, quote, we need our organ because our interest is shamefully neglected and our rights ignored by the American press, end quote. To return to the sal salutatory, Clark saw black Americans as the intellectual leaders of democracy in the United States. Quote, this generation is seeking anew the truths of the past, and the colored man is called to the high position of instructor. This is a nod to Professor Taylor's reference to Clark as an educator. Above all, we will strive to secure that union of action by colored men against oppression that if continued any reasonable time will compel the whites either to grant that republicanism is a failure or admit us to the full enjoyment of our rights as American citizens, end quote. I wanna conclude by noting that none of this conversation would have been possible without staff at an American Antiquarian Society. Here we have a Claire Morton, Gabrielle Foreman, and other summer participants seated in the learning lab with Herald of Freedom at the table. We've heard from Vince Golden. Now we're here from McClare and AAS Conservation who worked diligently over the summer to make sure we had a chance to see the paper in person. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Dr. Spires. So today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the conservation concerns with the newspapers. Uh, we're gonna look at some slides for that. And then we're going to do a little hands-on um, look around at some of the techniques and materials that we use here in the lab. So if I could bring up my slides. Okay, <laughs> so as Vince had mentioned at the beginning, issue three was in multiple parts and it was torn along where it had been creased and those tears were really tattered and there were fragments of text just holding on very vicariously. Um, uh, here you can see some images from issue one which although it was in one piece, it had also been creased and was quite uh, tattered and abraded along those creases. Uh, both the papers had quite a lot of soiling and surface dirt. A lot of this was a really fine particulate soot. Uh, the bottom images on the screen show that there was also a sort of greasy uh, substance that was obscuring some of the text. Slide. And then another issue was that the papers were overall slightly yellowed. And then on some of the edges, they were very yellowed and quite brittle. And what's actually happening here is a process called acidification and oxidation. So on a molecular level, paper is actually made up of tiny chains of polymers. And uh, when exposed to sunlight or types of acid, these polymer chains break down and this can make the paper yellow or make it very brittle. In the image on the top, you can see the effects of sunlight and soot on the paper, how it's made it very yellow and brittle. So our treatment steps, firstly, we surface cleaned the papers. And this was a really delicate process because especially on the tattered edges, uh, 
they were so fragile. And cleaning both papers took about four days. <laughs> and then next we uh, we washed the papers in deionized water. And you can see in this image how the water is quite yellow. And so what this does when we wash is any of the degraded polymer chains, the broken links of the polymer chains are rinsed out of the paper. So that's why the water is turned a little bit yellow. And this helps uh, rid the paper of the degradation products. And then we added an alkaline to the water baths and this deacidifies the paper and adds an alkaline sort of buffer, an alkaline reserve. And this helps to prevent further acidification in the future. And then after the pieces had been put under felts and weights to dry flat, the long process of mending began. And this took many days. Um, since newspapers have a uh, very small print on both sides, it's pretty impossible to sort of hide mending strips. So we use really, really thin tissue, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, so that it doesn't obscure the text. Here you can see before and after shots of issue one. And on both of the newspapers, the soot was successfully removed and the stains were reduced. Uh, unfolding the creases revealed more of the text and mending the tears and abraded areas stabilized the paper and made it more easy to handle. And here's an image of issue three before and after. So issue three is now back in one piece and all of the small fragments along the edges have been secured. My favorite part of working with issue three was going along the torn edges and slowly unfurling sort of tangled pieces of text and gaining more text and therefore knowledge in the process. Uh, hardly any text was lost, luckily. Um, issue one is almost completely intact and there were only a few words missing where it had become abraded along the creases. Issue three had a few lines of text missing along that center tear, but is almost completely intact. So now, um, if we switch back to Nate on the camera, and if you'd like to join me, we're going to have a little look at some of the materials that we use here in the lab. So over here, this is where we do our surface cleaning. And you can see there are some documents that are a little dirty. <laughs> so this is uh, called soot sponge and it very gently just removes the surface dirt from the paper. This is a very forgiving paper. Uh, it's likely a linen rag paper, which was common in this era. But we also have other methods for more delicate papers. Uh, this paper here is actually the New Orleans Tribune. And it's a really delicate paper. Being stored in New Orleans for most of its life, it's gone through cycles of humidification, which can be quite damaging to the paper. For this one, it would be very, very gentle. This is actually a type of cosmetic sponge that has no additives. And these are quite gentle to remove any surface grime. We also occasionally use what looks like Parmesan cheese, but is not. Uh, this is grated eraser crumbs. And we use this by putting it on the surface of the paper and just gently sort of massaging it. And it removes surface dirt, which we'll see. If you compare <laughs> the used crumbs to the fresh crumbs, 
they slowly get darker as they pick up the dust. So next, <laughs> over here, this scares people sometimes because you think that paper and water is not a very good mix and it's probably not a good idea, but this is a very common treatment in paper conservation uh, to bathe the papers. And this is a very acidified newspaper. So in the bath, it's, it's rinsing out those degradation products and getting some of that yellow coloring out. Uh, if I place a piece of Polytex mesh on top so that we can handle the paper a little bit, you can see that if we sort of press the paper, <laughs> all of the yellow coming out around it. So it's just sort of leaching out all of the degradation products from the paper, which is quite satisfying. So this will go through a few more baths and will hopefully uh, help to stabilize the paper. If we step over here, I can show you some of the tissues that we use for mending. So these tissues uh, are usually from Japan. They're often handmade and they're made with fibers from mulberry trees, which are really long and strong fiber for their weight. You can see that it's almost like a cobweb. And so when we use it to mend uh, printed items with text, it can sit on top of the text and the text will remain visible beneath. And this is what we used for most of the mends for the Herald of Freedom so that the text was still visible. Other areas that don't have text, you might use a slightly thicker tissue to give the paper a little more strength. And if there's a loss in the paper, we can create a fill with a slightly thicker tissue. And, and here are the heralds. You can see um, some of the fills in here. They're pretty hard to see, which is a good sign. <laughs> There's still a bit of uh, surface staining, but they're in a much better condition and are much more stable to handle. And hopefully researchers will be able to read them soon. Thank you, thank you very much. And we're gonna switch back over to Nan for the question and answer. Great, thank you. There we go. Thank you all for your great perspectives. This has been really fun to, to learn more about the Herald of Freedom. We have um, a good amount of time for questions from the audience, comments from all of you who presented. So really looking forward to follow up um, and questions are already starting to come in. And I think a nice one to kind of follow up um, from what Eclair was presenting is one from Cheryl Thurber who wonders um, how many issues of the paper were released and how many have survived. So I wonder if either Derek or uh, Nikki, if you'd like to um, respond to that. Well, I don't know if Derek knows, but in my research, it was, I think it, the paper failed after like five months. What did you find, Derek? I'm about the same and full confession, part of what I know comes from your work and Vince in combination. Um, so about four or five months, which isn't terribly unusual for a newspaper in the United States. They were popping up all over the place and failing all over the place. Um, and the amount of reprinting the Herald of Freedom received across other papers suggests that it was more of a financial issue than the sense that it wasn't seen by his peers as an important issue. You could try to do the math on like uh, a paper every week over four months, but it's not a given that um, he issued an is a paper every week either given the financial constraints. So. Um, I wonder if um, both of you might, that is uh, Dr. Taylor and Dr. Spires could just say something about 
your response when you learned that um, that these issues had been uncovered here. I know, um, I think, uh, Dr. Taylor, that Vince had reached out to you to let you know if 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 I remember his saying. Is that is that correct? Yeah, it, yeah. it just um, I <laughs> I was stunned. I I couldn't believe it. I was happy, elated but also heartbroken that the book had already been out a decade and I had turned over every stone. Um, the person I inherited the project from Walter Hertz, rest his soul, had also turned over every rock and stone because Peter Clark left no papers anywhere. And I mean, the things that we found have been scattered across many different archives, estate sales here and there. And so imagine my surprise that somebody found this. I, I just, I couldn't believe it at first. I said, is this real? And so I'm really excited. And I wonder what else you guys have, to be <laughs> honest. <laughs> yeah, you never know what's going to show up. <laughs> yes. Uh, Derek, do you want to comment on that? Because you you made good use of it during the, the seminar last summer, right? Yeah, um, the first response was so cool. Like, um, and a reminder that no matter how much we know about black print, we're still just on the tip of the iceberg. How much we have and part of that's because for years, people weren't looking and preserving these materials. Um, the other thing I thought was, and I'm, I'm sad that Vince can be with us, but this is kind of classic Vince. <laughs> Like if you go to AAS and talk to any of the curators there, there's always some new and exciting thing that's just popped up. And so it, it was both exciting and brand new and also kind of typical. Like it, it's just one of those things, right? Um, and nice to be able to share that excitement with the summer participants who are also really, you know, grateful uh, for Claire and conservation for getting it ready, but also just happy to be able to lay eyes on it. Yeah, yeah, great to be able to have it out for, for workshops. Um, so here's a question from Tom Dal Dalton, who's um, wondering if there's any connection between Clark's paper and Nathaniel Peabody Rogers' Herald, Herald of Freeman, uh, Freedom in New Hampshire. Um, I, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so either. Um, yeah. Clark, if there were, I think Clark would have mentioned in, in those um, early um, mission statements and it's slightly a bit before Clark's time and outside of his region. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, here's a question that I think Claire may be able to address uh, from David Cole Glazier. He is wondering if you scan fragile printed sheets to preserve their condition in an image and record the content via machine reading. Hmm. Um, scanning the text into machine reading would be a digitization uh, process. I'm not sure if they do that downstairs on the conservation side. We photo document everything uh, before, during, and after treatment, just to keep records of everything going on conservation-wise. Um, yeah, maybe does someone know on the digitization side if it can be automatically turned into digital text or? Yeah, that's that is uh, a question we will um, we'll leave for now um, and see if, <laughs> if there's. But yes, that's a. Uh, um, just interesting way to think about how various aspects of print is um, preserved and, and made available. Um, moving on to a question um, from Frank Fee, which um, references that Clark worked with Frederick Douglass in 1855 and also put out the Herald in 1855. Was he with Douglass before or after or during the life of the Herald? Uh, he was with him before. Okay. Yep. Great. Thank you. Um, Bill Hart is asking if we know the reach of his readership. Were most of his readers living in Cincinnati or did his paper reach readers beyond, perhaps in Pittsburgh? I would 
would imagine most of his readers would have been in Ohio in that surrounding region, maybe Northern Kentucky, maybe even Pittsburgh. And it just really mattered where the uh, agents took the paper. Um, and maybe Dr. Spires, ha he has more knowledge about the actual uh, process of, of newspaper agents and things like that. I'm not as well versed with that, but I know they traveled as far as the agents carried them. And I know papers um, could go, you know, internationally if people were willing to do so, but I, I, I doubt that his went internationally and I doubt it got to the East Coast, but probably more of a regional thing, but maybe Dr. Spires might have some more insight. Yes. Carolyn Slope um, in the chat said part of what I was about to say, which is follow the rail lines, which is part of um, Clark's pitch. Um, and I think thinking of it as an Ohio paper makes sense to me, especially because Clark himself wanted it to be an Ohio paper. That's another contrast between Clark and Day. Day really had kind of national, international aspirations, whereas Clark really was starting from the local and working his way out from there. Um, the other two notes on this I'd say is, um, is this one of the things we miss when we only have maybe one issue of the paper? Because papers will usually begin to outline subscription agents and get letters in from other readers, and that can give you a sense of where it went. So, for instance, Douglas's paper and Colored American went to places like Haiti and Jamaica, and we know this because we have subscription agents there. Um, the other thing I'd note is that whether or not Clark's physical papers traveled broadly to readerships outside of Ohio, we know that other people were aware of it because he was getting reprinted elsewhere. And so when we start thinking about his readers as people who are reading things reprinted from his paper, then, you know, then Clark's paper goes wherever, say, Douglas's paper goes. And I think, too, just to add to that, Dr. Spires, I think we have to also remember that Peter Clark was a convention man. And so he participated not just in Ohio state color conventions, but in the national convention movement. And so he had friends, not just Douglas, but Mer Mercer Langston and, and others all around the country. And so it probably would have been easy for him to just drop you know, a newspaper in the mail um, you know, it was a source of pride to him to be an editor of a paper, and he had a long history. This was, as I said, this is not the first time he had been closely connected to a newspaper, and so, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure it probably traveled that way. I also know that he had, later in his life, connections to the city of St. Louis, and so, you know, I'm wondering, and Cincinnati and St. Louis had a lot of similarities um, for various reasons, if nothing else, ethnic uh, demographic makeup reasons. And so, um, it, you know, it might be, uh, might may have even found some copies there if, if, if there were any extant copies. So it's not beyond the possibility that it could have traveled in a you know haphazard way to other yeah. places. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. I mean, things travel in ways it's hard to hard to know, but certainly those connections are between St. Louis and Cincinnati are very interesting. Um, and Richard Brown is asking who were the advertisers? Would either one of you like to to take that one? Derek? There was more of a wait one sec because I'm pulling up the PDF. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, fun with newspapers. Um, so he's got wholesale groceries. Levi Coffin was a big uh, supporter. Um, he has advertisements from um, wholesale manufacturers, um, manufacturers of shirts and textiles, grocery stores, um, dressmakers, um, et cetera. That's just from the first issue. Um, he's also asking people to donate or at least contribute to starting the paper. And James Ball and Coffin are two of the people he names as locals who can who can be trusted to take in the funds. Um, so that's 
what I can see just from the first issue. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, here's a question from uh, Manisha Sinha. Um, she says, I think a lot of black activists and abolitionists use the used names of abolitionist newspapers like Carrie's Provincial Freeman after Pennsylvania Freeman. So I would not be surprised if Clark used Rogers' title, uh, which was also associated with labor radicalism and abolition. Oh, thank you, Manisha. Okay, so that's great to have that, um, that comment. Yes. Um, and let's move from one um, star historian to another. Um, Gabriel Freeman um, is saying, can you talk a bit about the larger context of the paper, the circuits of black activism, the high level of political organizing? Ohio is the center of so much activism. What does this mean for the definition of the local? That's a great question. Um, I'll just start by noting that, you know, white riots in Cincinnati were one of the, uh, the principal um, inciting incidents of the National Color Convention Movement in the 1830s. And Clark would have been all of three or four years old at that time. One, one. So he was he was born into it, right? His, his, his life tracks with the Color Conventions Movement and Ohio was among, if not the first state to have a state con state convention movement starting in the 1830s. Um, and his paper, along with William Howard Day Day's paper and other Ohio papers were intimately connected to that movement. Clark himself um, attended the national conventions across Ohio and Pennsylvania. He was at the Philadelphia convention, Rochester convention. Um, he was at the, um, the found he was present for the founding of the Radical Republican Party, not mistaken. Uh, I'll leave Dr. Taylor to talk about that. Um, one of the other things I learned from your book, um, in part. Um, but what that means to go back to what Dr. Taylor said earlier about the newspaper is that even though Clark pitched Ohio, pitched the paper as a local Ohio paper, he pitched it in the context of a larger national and international Black activist movement. And he and other Black Ohioans in particular were in tension with folks like Frederick Douglass who wanted Frederick Douglass's paper to be the national paper. And they would argue, well, Ohio is a very different space from say New York State. And uh, we need um, a press newspapers to speak to the specificity of what's happening in Black Ohio to get a real sense of sort of how to make a national movement work. And even to burrow down further, Black Ohio is different from Black Cleveland, right? That proximity to Canada versus proximity to the South, that's huge, right? Um, and so even in setting himself, contrasting what his paper is doing and what Day's paper is doing speaks to both the complexity of Black activism um, at any level, but also the wide range of concerns and ways of getting at um, these problems. Thank you, Dr. Schrez. I think you do an excellent job. I think historians and scholars have, have pretty much largely ignored the political activism and the complexity in Ohio. I mean, I started this conversation with my book, Frontiers of Freedom, continued it with, with this one and my third one, and it, it was very complex. Ohio never had slavery legally on its soil. So that meant that it was a very relatively large free black community, communities in Columbus, Cincinnati, Dayton, and, and Cleveland and uh, uh, Columbus. And, and these, they were fairly educated in, in terms of, you know, they had very early on uh, uh, very strong private schools that people from all around the country were sending their children to be educated in Cincinnati's public schools. So they're free. They're very well educated. They're politically astute. Uh, Peter Clark was one of the earliest Black people to really advocate uh, political independence from uh, the mainstream political parties, the, the kind of bipartisan system. He says, maybe we should try political independence. And he spoke of that with the Chillicothe movement that I talk about in 
maybe books one and two, I can't remember, they're all blurring together at this point. But uh, and so it's a lot of complexity. And at the center of all of this is a struggle for Black citizenship. They understood that the struggle for abolition was inextricably linked to the struggle for Black citizenship. So they never separated those things in Ohio. Well, thank you. Thank you both. Um, let's bring in Eclair just a bit here. Eclair, I wondered if you would be willing to just say a few words about what it was like for you to work on this object, because um, as a conservator, it, it must be, well, one would imagine um, that it might be a little bit nerve wracking to work on such um, a, a document that um, is so rare. Um, and maybe you just put that out of your mind when you do this kind of work, but could you share how, how what that experience was like for you? Definitely nerve wracking, yeah. <laughs> As the only known copy, uh, for sure. Um, it really put a lot of it, I mean, every document is important, but um, saving every tiny little piece of text um, when it was so tattered was, was, a job, but um, but yeah, it's so important. And it was great to be at AAS. Um, I actually read uh, part of Dr. Taylor's biography and got to sit in on some of the seminar sessions and learn more about Peter Clark. So yeah, it was a really great experience. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to um, take the initiative here and uh, ask our uh, Vice President for Collections, Lauren Hughes, who happens to be in the room here, um, and not to put her on the spot, but when you have a curator at hand, you always like to call on her. <laughs> so Lauren Hughes, our Vice President for Collections, because we have some questions here about um, the re if we have a record about how this paper came into collections, which Vince addressed a little bit, I think, but also if there are routine channels in the library world to advertise um, the presence of a paper like this and to seek additional issues. Would you like to speak about that? I'll get out of the way and you can come can. right in okay. here. Uh, yeah, so I can certainly address the, um, do we have any record of how the paper came into the collection? Vince mentioned this in his video that the paper was in um, one of our backlogs, which is something else that, um, it's something all libraries have. Um, the soil and the dirt that Eclair pointed out makes me think that this paper was actually in our second building because the fourth, third and fourth floor of that building was heated by coal. And so it ends up having a lot of the prints in our collection and newspapers in our collections that were stored on that floor have that kind of sooty, uh, greasy material. So that would say that the paper had been in our collection since before 1912. And in that period, libraries and museums did not take good notes about when material came in. Um, particularly a paper like this, where there were two issues folded. It was not a big giant bound volume that was screaming out, take care of me, take care of me. These were things that could be tucked into a box and dealt with later. Um, we also have to remember that there was no Google before 1912. So when the paper was looked at, at that time when it came in, there wasn't, it wasn't listed in any of the bibliographies. There was no way to kind of understand what they were looking at. They couldn't just put in the title and, and find it the way Vince was able to do uh, looking through his sources. So we don't have a record. We don't have like an acquisitions file or anything like that on the paper because of the time period in which it came in. Um, the other question was about what's what are the networks like for libraries? And libraries are really good at this. <laughs> so we are um, built to talk to each other. Um, if you've ever done an interlibrary loan request from your local public library, you know, suddenly you're getting a book from the other side of your state that is networked in. So the fact that the paper is now in our catalog means that it's available via something called OCLC, which is a large um, national network. So anyone looking for the paper who typed into WorldCat, which is the OCLC work uh, interface, which is something that, that students learn to use in school and, and people who are doing research tend to 
trip onto in the internet, um, we'll find it and we'll see it there. We've also done, there was a blog post, I think that Amanda put in the chat. So there's a post on the on our website, which does get picked up by Google. While you guys were all talking, I was like, geez, when did the last issue get it? You know, it was, I think it was November of 18, 19, 1855. And I'm Googling and up comes, you know, Nikki Taylor's book. <laughs> you know, um, the, the blog post that was written during the seminar. Uh, so the networking uh, it definitely is happening. And we'll continue. Back to, back to Dan. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lauren. Always good to have curatorial expertise in the room. Um, so we're getting close to the end of our time, um, but we have, uh, let's see. Another question here from uh, Frank Fee about um, Douglas Garrison and some other anti-slavery slavery editors were supposed supported in no way by women's anti-slavery organizations. Did Clark have support from any similar organizations? Was Clark's largely Ohio focus? Uh, did it preclude some resources that more nationally focused publications enjoyed? Any response? I, I don't. Um... He, he wasn't really that great on women. And I don't mention any support that he got from women. Um, not that he was anti-woman. He, I just didn't find any sources. You know, we're limited by the sources that we find, but it's a great question um, about the community in that area that supported him. And I think, uh, and what was the second part of that question, Nan? Um, was Clark's, um, uh, his largely Ohio focus, um, did that preclude some resources that more nationally focused publications enjoyed? Um, well, you know, he, he had a national outlook, you know, he, he just resided in Ohio but he was, he had a national focus. Like he participated, he was a leading voice of the great railroad strike of 1877. I just didn't mention that here. He had very uh, strong views about reconstruction. I just didn't have a chance to share that here. He had very strong views about integration. And I just didn't share that here. That is all in my larger biography of him very shocking views, which you would not expect. And that's the beauty of being able to write a biography is that you can position the person in their own local community while also looking out into a national, you know, placing them in the national context. And so, I, you know, I don't wanna say he was just this small myopic person that only was a local guy. He was a local guy who acted nationally. Uh, and, and so I wanna make sure I emphasize that. Yes, just, thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Derek. Just add a, a little bit to this, especially on the front of Ohio. Um, and I don't know how much Clark would have been able to plug into these things, but there were sufficient resources in Ohio, just Ohio, to sustain a paper. Um, Ohio State had a pretty robust Black convention movement that was running since the 1830s. Um, they had a pretty robust anti-slavery organization that affiliated with the national orgs. And they had a pretty strong black middle class. Um, and whether or not all of those pieces jived with Clark's politics at the time might be a question, but it's also just that newspapers are hard, even with the best resources. <laughs> William Howard Day, like physic both financially and physically just couldn't sustain the alien American, but just on, on sort of, in the abstract, he would have had the resources, he could have potentially had the resources, even if he were confined to Ohio, which he wasn't, but even if he were. Yeah, and that's a good point about uh, Black Ohio and that Black middle class, you're absolutely right. Yeah, and certainly it is a, a much larger and richer story. And um, I believe there was a link in the chat to Dr. Taylor's book. So. If you'd like to learn more about that rich story, um, do take a look um, at that. It's, it's a great book. Um, we are out of time, but I want to take just a minute to let you know about some upcoming programs before I, I thank all of our participants and our speakers today. Um, 
do go to our website to look at our upcoming programs next month. We will have on February 2nd, Martha Jones will be speaking um, about Vanguard, uh, her book Vanguard, and uh, Manisha Sinha will be moderating that talk. And then um, later on in February on the 23rd, Tara Bynum will be speaking about her new book, Reading Pleasure. So we very much look ahead and look forward to those uh, two virtual programs right here. You can register for those on our website. Thank you to all of our wonderful speakers. We really appreciate your expertise. And thank you to our attendees for joining us today. Uh, thank you and have a good evening.